Many people in Fukushima continue to worry about the health effects from the nuclear accident three years ago. Parents are especially concerned about the possibility of a rise in thyroid cancer among children. Healthcare experts are working to catch signs of illness as early as possible. NHK World's Mitsuko Nishikawa has more. A hospital in the village of Hirata has been leading a private program to provide thyroid checkups for the residents in Fukushima Prefecture. They've been conducting free ultrasound checkups for the past two years. After the accident at Fukushima Daiichi, huge amounts of radioactive substances were released into the atmosphere. The fallout included iodine, which tends to be absorbed and concentrated in the thyroid gland especially in children in their developmental periods. Many parents feel they need to remain on guard. I'm concerned about my child's health, so I take him in to be checked. Hajime Watanobe and his team from the hospital in Hirata reported the results from the screening in the first year of their program. They've tested more than 1,100 children aged 18 and under. In addition to ultrasound tests, we've been conducting blood and urine tests for all the children who come in for checkups. The results of their study show 70 percent had mild abnormalities. That included nodules or lumps in the thyroid of up to 5 millimeters in diameter and cysts measuring up to 20 millimeters. They say these abnormalities are not necessarily illnesses. But they say they need to be watched carefully for a long term. Local health authorities are also conducting thyroid gland tests for those who were 18 and under at the time of the nuclear accident. The program run by Fukushima Prefecture has tested 270,000 people so far. Their results show 53% had no abnormalities, while 46% had mild abnormalities. Watanobe says the difference in the prevalence of abnormalities could be due to the fact that they are taking more time to conduct the ultrasound checks. When we think about uh, uh, epidemiological study, probably we will need to continue our thorough checkups at least uh, several decades until we get a definite answer for the Fukushima citizenry. Health officials say there is no evidence of an increase in thyroid cancer among the children in Fukushima. But Watanobe says healthcare services will need to provide thorough thyroid checkups in order to detect possible health risks at an early stage. Mitsuko Nishikawa, NHK World, Fukushima. Japanese government officials have designated areas that need to bolster their preparations for possible major earthquakes and tsunami. Prime Minister Shinzo Abe made the designations based on advice from the Government Council on Disaster Prevention. The move is aimed at being ready in the event of major quakes. They are focusing on the possibilities of one hitting underneath Tokyo and the other along the Nankai Trough of central and western Japan. These earthquakes could have a serious effect on the country's society and economy. They could impact the capital's key functions, and tsunami could cause widespread damage. The government will make a unified and speedy effort to implement anti-disaster measures. A total of 310 municipalities in Tokyo and nine neighboring prefectures were designated as areas that need to take urgent anti-disaster steps. 707 municipalities spanning nearly 30 prefectures were named as areas that should strengthen preparations for a Nankai trough quake. Officials say the regions could be hit by a tremor with an intensity of six minus or more and tsunami waves three meters or higher. The Japanese intensity scale runs from zero to seven. They say almost 140 municipalities could be inundated within 30 minutes after a Nankai quake. 
The communities have been designated as areas eligible for greater state support to help prepare for tsunami. Welcome back. Tomorrow marks the 35th anniversary of the start of the Three Mile Island nuclear disaster at the Three Mile Island nuclear power plant near Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And while 35 years have passed, there are still a lot of questions that have not been answered about that disaster. For instance, what really started the chain of events at Three Mile Island? And just how dangerous were the radiation levels coming out of that plant? And more importantly, why does the nuclear industry continue to claim that no one died at Three Mile Island when all the facts seem to say otherwise? Folks over at Beyond Nuclear have released a new report on Three Mile Island just in time for the anniversary that sheds new light on that nuclear disaster. Joining me now to talk more about that report, as well as, as, as the rest of the day's nuclear power news, is Kevin Camps, radioactive waste watchdog at beyondnuclear.org. Hey, Kevin, welcome back. Thanks for having me. It's, great. It's, it's always great having you with us. What exactly happened at Three Mile Island? Well, it was a combination of mechanical failures and human error. So a precursor incident, just like what happened at Three Mile Island, happened at a twin reactor that's still operating, fright, frightfully, up in Toledo, Ohio, it's called Davis Bessie. This happened 18 months earlier. So what started it was the pumps that pumped cooling water through the system stopped operating. And there's still some mystery as to why that was. Was it electrical? Was it mechanical failure? And once that happened, it started a domino effect of things going wrong. One of the major ones was a pressure-operated relief valve stuck open, and it allowed massive amounts of cooling water from the core of the reactor to escape unbeknownst to the operators. So the warning lights that were indicating this were across the control room, sometimes hidden by tags of paper. So it was just this chaos that unfolded. And at Davis Bessey, Ohio, 18 months earlier, luckily an operator figured it out about half an hour later. But at Three Mile Island, they never figured it out. This went on for hours and for days, actually. And the lesson was not learned at Three Mile Island because the industry kept it quiet. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission kept it quiet. There was a whistleblower who tried to get the word out, but was unable to before Three Mile Island suffered its 50% meltdown. So, so what was happening was that the water that keeps the core cool was venting, it was being boiled off as steam, and that steam was venting to the outdoors, and the water level around the core dropped and as it dropped below the top of the core the, the the core started to melt yeah so this happened within the first hours the pressurizer on top of the reactor core was just letting the coolant out and they right. didn't realize it right so how much radiation was released in that in that steam that was coming out of the core depends on who you talk to. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission five years ago said 10 million curies, when their own people at the time in 1979 said 36 million curies. So Wait, what gives a there? A curie is a million picocuries, isn't it? Or is that a billion picocuries? It's a lot of radioactivity. I mean, you take a, a medical institution like Washington University in St. Louis has a major medical hospital with a thousand rooms for patients and laboratories. They have a grand total in their nuclear medicine division of two curies of radioactivity and there's lots of rules about how it's handled where it's stored because it's dangerous stuff two right. curies so nrc says 10 million curies got out at three mile island one of their people in 79 said 36 million but if you talk to arnie gunderson at fairwinds in vermont he says the actual figure is probably a hundred times more if not a thousand times more and it had a lot to do with the very small number of radiation monitors that were on site or even in the countryside went off scale immediately during Three Mile Island. Right. So they don't really know how much got out. But when you start to look at the experiences of the people downwind who are suffering symptoms of acute radiation poisoning, then you start to wonder, wasn't it much greater than this official version? What's the story of the people downwind and why haven't we heard this in the press? Well, thank goodness for people like Eileen Miyoko-Smith of Green Action in Japan who moved to Harrisburg after the accident began and took testimonials from hundreds of people. So people with uh, severe sunburns, those were probably beta burns from what was in the air. Uh, people who suffered nausea, who suffered severe headaches, who had hair loss, these are symptoms of very high levels of radiation exposure. So officially, that didn't happen. but. You know, uh, somebody like Steve Wing, an epidemiologist at UNC Chapel Hill, years later looked at the blood of people who suffered these symptoms, found clear biomarkers of radiation exposure, 
And sure enough, found an increase of things like leukemia and lung cancer two to tenfold higher than would be expected in the downwind areas. So when, you know, this myth is out there that no one died at Three Mile Island, well, you know, there's a lot of families who've lost people to things like cancer in the years since. How many, any estimate of how many people actually have died as a result of Three Mile Island? I don't have a figure in my head, but what I do have, you know, seared in my memory are, are these testimonials from people who suffered severe ailments in the aftermath, sometimes immediately. And also, this is, you know, some of the best farming country in the world, actually. So farmers who had uh, deaths among their cattle herd. There was one family that raised exotic birds, and they actually had 500 birds die all of a sudden, all at once, from no apparent cause. And what Arnie Gunderson at Fairwinds points out is, if this concentrated plume, and the air was very still for days on end, mm -hmm. so if this concentrated plume went down the valley and people were in it, then they were exposed to very high levels of hazardous radioactivity that officially was not even detected because the monitors were few and far between. Has anything changed? No, the lessons from Three Mile Island have not been learned in the United States by the nuclear establishment or over, overseas. So at Fukushima Daiichi, incredibly, we saw very similar things. The evacuation and emergency preparedness fiasco at Three Mile Island was repeated at Fukushima Daiichi. So you had you know, the village of Namai nearby Fukushima Daiichi. No instructions from the federal government, no instructions from the prefecture. So the mayor of Namai took his population of his town a certain distance away, thinking they were safer further away, right in the plume of radioactivity escaping from Fukushima Daiichi, uh, when the federal, the national government had data in its hands that they didn't let out as to where the radioactivity was going. So he later accused them of murder because he put those townspeople, the federal government put those townspeople very much in harm's way. Wow. And now in the, we, we have about a minute left, Kevin. We're, and, and we're still using these same kinds of reactors that are vulnerable to these same kinds of meltdowns? You've got Three Mile Island Unit 1 that's still operating. It's got a 20-year license extension from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. You've got davis Bessey, which has had any number of near misses with disaster, including a Three Mile Island scenario 18 months earlier, and they're trying to get 20 more years. Wow, wow. And, and, we've got, and we're building two new reactors in Georgia, do I have that right? Two new reactors in Georgia, another one, uh, in, another two in South Carolina. And you know, this official myth that nothing bad happened at Three Mile Island, they've used that to weaken the containment structures, for example, at, at new reactor designs, saying, well, you know, we can take some shortcuts here because nothing happened at Three Mile Island. Well, a lot happened at Three Mile Island. That's, that's absolutely insane. Kevin Camps, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you, Tom. Sick workers at Hanford continues to rise. This afternoon, the King 5 investigators broke the story that yet another employee got sick after inhaling unknown chemical vapors. Well, that brings the total to 18 workers there exposed to toxic vapors since just last Wednesday. King 5's Susanna Frame has the latest from the Tri-Cities. I'm standing alongside the Columbia River with the Hanford Nuclear Reservation behind me where many employees are wondering what is going on. We've been in contact with many Hanford workers and officials and so far no one's been able to explain why so many workers have gotten sick after being exposed to harmful vapors at Hanford just this month. The latest incident happened this afternoon when uh, a worker was outside doing some routine sampling. It's our understanding that that person was not wearing a respirator or any other protective gear. We're unsure why that's happening in light of the recent events. Just yesterday, six people got sick from uh, ingesting fumes, inhaling fumes. That sent two of them to the hospital. Both have been released, but sources tell us they continue to have some symptoms, such as getting dizzy, having headaches, and rapid heartbeats. The exposures have happened in different locations in the areas known as the tank farms. The government contractor in charge of those areas say they're conducting tests to figure out what is going on and exactly what their workers have been exposed to. They say they're doing all they can, but many of the workers we've talked to say the company is just reacting and not doing enough proactive activity to keep them safe. In Richland, Susanna Frame, King 5 News.